Hello and welcome to a new series exploring the history of map making from classical times to the early 20th century. Maps, the word comes from the Latin mappa for napkin and the reason they were drawn tell us much about the times in which they were created and about the preoccupations and interests of those who made them. For historians, they're an invaluable snapshot in time, a window into the past. A series of maps of the same area, drawn over different periods of time, enable the layers of history to be peeled back to tell a story of evolving landscapes and settlements. They're endlessly fascinating. My rather weak joke is that it's easy to get lost in maps. The champion of local history, W.G. Hoskins, wrote in The Making of the English Landscape, the one-inch map of the Ordnance Survey is the foundation of topographical knowledge in England. This map, printed in Ulm in Germany in 1482, is among several versions and reproductions based on the work of Claudius Ptolemy, a Greek astronomer and geographer living in Alexandria in the second century AD, and shows the extent of world knowledge in antiquity. Christopher Columbus would have had access to a map like this on which to base his navigational calculations before voyaging west across an uncharted Atlantic. An attempt at a projection in order to accurately portray a three-dimensional object in two dimensions clearly shows an understanding that the world was not flat, something that would have been obvious to sailors. The continents of Europe and Asia and the northern half of Africa are recognisable in outline and are like the way various winds are personified around the perimeter. This is the Iberian Peninsula from a version of Ptolemy created around 1467 by Nicholas Germany, a Benedictine monk at Reichenbach Priory. This is the British Isles. Ireland, Ibernia, at the edge of the world known to Ptolemy, is shown in remarkable detail. The main rivers are marked with their Latin names. Buvinda is the River Boyne, Duris the River Shannon, and a number of towns, even inland towns, are named, demonstrating just how connected the ancient world was. Where did Ptolemy get the information on which to base his calculations? We may assume access to the contents of the Great Library of Alexandria in its heyday, and he would have questioned soldiers, sailors, merchants and other travellers. Ptolemy's map is an amazing achievement. Geographical knowledge, informed by scientific analysis, observation, mathematical logic and imagination. Its rediscovery in Renaissance Europe kick-started increasing cartographic awareness. We might define Ptolemy's map as humanist. Other maps of the world, Mapamundi, were drawn with a religious rather than a geographic purpose, where Ptolemy reflects the actual geography by orienting his map with north at the top. The influence of Christianity led to most Western European medieval maps being drawn with east at the top, the direction of Jerusalem, where the sun rises and the direction from which the second coming was expected. Ptolemy's projection was used by mapmaker Martin Waldzimuller, working in conjunction with a group of scholars at the Vosges Gymnasium in Lorraine, to produce a world map incorporating information from the voyages of discovery by Christopher Columbus and Amerigo Vespucci, among others. Published in 1507, the map is made up of 12, 18 by 24 inch sections printed from woodcuts and intended to be wall mounted. Of a thousand copies thought to have been produced, only one is known to have survived, purchased by the US Library of Congress, Washington DC, for $10 million. Ptolemy's map was still awaiting rediscovery when this Anglo-Saxon map, which dates to around 1025 to 1050 was created. Like Ptolemy's map, it shows Europe, Asia and Northern Africa, the three known continents. 
The orientation is eastwards. At the top is the island of Sri Lanka, here labelled Taprabain, the name by which it was known to the ancient Greeks. As well as geographical features, the mythical pillars of Hercules are illustrated. Traditionally, where the Western world ended until Hercules bulldozed through, creating the Strait of Gibraltar and linking the Mediterranean Sea to the Atlantic Ocean. A drawing of a lion in Asia supplements a text declaring, here they abound. And although the map doesn't have an overtly religious focus, there are biblical references. For example, Noah's Ark is depicted. While not exactly accurate, the map has clearly identifiable elements. Northwestern Europe is particularly well represented. Some of the outline is likely to derive from a much earlier Roman original, which the mapmaker has updated. Most of the inscriptions are in Latin, with some in Old English. Major bodies of water, the rivers, lakes and seas of Africa and the Middle East are coloured red, and mountain ranges are shaded green. The size of the southwest peninsula of Britain in the bottom left corner is exaggerated, which may reflect the importance of Cornish tin and trading connections in the period. Two warriors are shown fighting here. Is it the scene of a battle or a warning about the nature of the inhabitants? London and Winchester, the two primary centres of power and commerce in Anglo-Saxon England are marked, along with Armagh in Ireland. Jerusalem, Rome and Alexandria are shown as walled cities. This map, the oldest surviving Anglo-Saxon Mapamundi, reflects a time of Danish dominance in an England ruled by King Canute. Far from isolated at the edge of the known world, but an integral part of a Scandinavian empire extending over much of northwestern Europe. Next time, I'm going to take a look at the famous Hereford Mapamundi, a map with a religious rather than geographic purpose, and a fascinating map of Britain from the mid 13th century. If you've enjoyed this video, hit the like and subscribe buttons and click on the notification bell to be informed when the next video is available. Or you can subscribe by clicking on the rose window over my shoulder.